All right, hello there. This is Gerd Leonhardt, CEO of the Futures Agency, Futurist in Basel, Switzerland. And I'm very happy to have with me today uh, Carlo Donzello from Rome. He's going to introduce himself shortly. And uh, he's the wizard of the smart city. And the uh, topic today is going to be handled by Doug Stevens, who is uh, uh, otherwise known as the Retail Prophet. Uh, and we've just recently met here in beautiful Switzerland and had a great chat and figured we should do something. So let's start with Doug. Just kind of briefly say what you do and then we'll ping pong back and forth. Thanks, Garrett. My name is Doug Stevens. I'm the president of Retail Profit. Retail Profit is a futures consultancy that specializes in the retail industry, looking specifically at changes in retailing and consumerism. We work with large brands, trade associations, government, and, uh, and mid-sized retail uh, companies as well, uh, just to give them a sense of where things are changing, where things are going into the future. Great. I love the name, you know, Retail Profit. I, uh takes a lot of balls to, to say that you're the prophet, which I, which I like, you know. Uh, let's have another prophet over here. He looks like a prophet over here. Uh, that's Carlo from uh, from beautiful Rome, about 100 meters from the Pope, he said, you know. We, we were hoping that Carlo would be the next Pope, but it didn't pan out, so uh, maybe he wasn't religious enough. So, Carlo, what do you do? Tell, tell us briefly what you do. Uh, hello, everybody. Yeah, I'm uh, mostly based in Rome, even if I travel very extensively, as most of you, and i um, Say uh, consulting to uh, public agencies in Rome uh, about uh, say the future of uh, smart cities and uh, Rome, uh, of course, has the ambition of uh, being one of the cities. And uh, so I'm uh, overseeing a number of uh, uh, say applications uh, in this uh, in this area, mostly digital applications, and also overseeing the, the, the plan for uh, this new uh, district uh, of uh, digital technologies. Okay, great. So and wait, 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 I'm particularly interesting in, interested also in uh, the future of retail because uh, I'm, I'm too I'm quite convinced that uh, whatever is, is related with uh, uh, digital commerce and digital retail is, is really Still, quite very important for cities. Okay, great. Let's go. Uh, let's go back from the from the city to the uh, to the retailing part. So, uh, Doug, you you want to bring up a uh, something that had to do with Mark Anderson and what he said. Let's start there. Yeah, it was kind of interesting. You know, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Mark Andreessen, and, and for those who aren't familiar with who Mark Andreessen is, if you go all the way back to the Netscape days, Mark Andreessen, of course, was one of the co-founders of Netscape. Today, he's very influential venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, and uh, he's invested in things like Pinterest and that sort of thing. So he was interviewed, and I believe it was in Wired Magazine, and he said, came flat out, and he said, retail is dead. Basically, if, if, you're a, if you're a retailer, you may as well turn out the lights, lock the doors, it's over, uh, we're going to buy everything as consumers from the internet, and he made this sound very, very impending. So, you know, the, the industry, for the industry, there was this collective sort of gasp. People couldn't believe it. And so it caused a lot of conversation in, in the industry. And I wrote an article in response to that, and, and I, I tried to look very objectively at this. Um, and then, of course, when you look at the statistics, they're compelling. You know, there's you know in, in upwards of now of a trillion dollars in, in e-commerce business worldwide. It may only be about six seven percent of total retail sales but it's growing at a, at a pace of about 12 to 15 percent a year so it is very likely in 30 years or rather in in 10 years that 30 percent of everything we buy conceivably could be coming to us um, through through the web so in a digital you know, way but you know then again mark anderson said this 1999 when he invested in webvan and lost about 700 million he said the same thing uh, was going to be the end of retail. He lost all that money, I think. Um, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I think he's a genius, but is he right now, or is he, you know, Carlo? What, what's your view? Make it, make it swift. Well, you know, I, I believe first of all that uh, uh, he's well known for this uh, very, say, journalistic <laughs> title, uh, rather than uh, I remember the one about one year ago that was the his famous uh, the software is eating up the world. Uh, That's why I like from, him. Uh, from <laughs> and uh, so probably again, you have to distinguish the say the, the title the uh, from the substance. So probably maybe we can reword what he was saying. It's the end of the retail as we know it. Okay, so probably let's, let's about go back to this. Doug here. 
Uh, Doug, we, can, what, we can agree. You obviously don't agree, Doug, that it, this is, I mean, you do, I, you do I, agree. I, I, you do I agree. don't agree that it's the end of retail. And, I, and, the, and the reason I say as that- we, As we know it. As we know it, yeah, that, that I agree with. I think that the thing, the thing that's key here is that if we only shopped in order to acquire things, I would totally agree with Andreessen. Why, why, would you, why would you go out to a store when you could just have things delivered to your home? But we don't shop purely to acquire things. We shop because I think there's a, an embedded social need. I think it's in our DNA somehow that we, we, we long to go to the market. So to Carlo's point, I think that's absolutely right. It isn't the end of retail, but it is absolutely the end of retail as we know it. Well, if this is the end, what's the future? T tell us, I mean, you're an expert on this, and you just spoke in Switzerland a couple of weeks ago about this. And uh, ironically, right after I met you, I, I met these other guys uh, where I was doing a, giving a talk on the future of retail uh, to the mm. uh, to the Tengelmann Group in Germany, and I, I was able to use some of the stuff that we talked about. But if that's the past, you know, if, if retail is changing like this, what is the future? Where where is it going? Well, I think the big, one of the key things. I really think that the key acknowledgement that retailers need to understand is that for centuries, retail was about distribution. I mean, it. it it's what the word means, you know, to, right. to take something and to divide it up into smaller parts and to distribute it. And so we live in a world now, in a, in a post-internet, post-mobile, post-digital world, we live in a world where access to product is no longer a problem for the consumer. Right. They don't rely on retail to provide distribution of products. So the question becomes, if product distribution isn't the purpose of retail, what is? And so it, it, it conjures up these questions for retailers that, you know, what is it exactly that you sell now? And my belief is that retail is now in the business of selling experiences. Right. And that's and probably I that's always, I mean, if you're, if this is happening, this is happening in other media also. But, you know, if uh, Sony said five years ago at CES, it said they're not in the business of selling products. Right? Uh, this is what the CEO of Sony said, and they do sell products, you know, boxes, you know. So uh, this is a huge shift, clearly. But uh, you mentioned this idea of collective branding or the third shelf, right? And this is your book right over there, by the way. <laughs> I, I've just got it on the Kindle. Uh, it's in my queue. Okay. I think it's available on the Kindle that I uh, or did I order it in print. But anyway, I've got a huge uh, queue of stuff here. So continue. This is a good topic. Well, yeah, and this, this notion of the third shelf, you know, right now, I guess um, everybody in the industry is trying to determine which channels are dying. And I know, Gerd, you probably see this in, in the communications and, and entertainment channels, too. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to come down to this binary sort of answer, which channels, which channels are dead, which channels are, are, are alive, and which are prospering. And I guess the, the, uh, the, the real awakening here is that channels aren't dying, but they're merging. You know, and, and they're, they're coming together and consumers are, are crossing these channels very seamlessly on an increasing basis. So this idea of the third shelf is sort of the idea that we need to stop thinking in terms of channels and devices and we need to start thinking in terms of the moments in a consumer's life when they actually need a, a certain product because we now have the technology not to just advertise them to them, advertise to them at that moment, but to actually take the opportunity to buy the product to them mm -hmm. in that instant. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what media they're looking at. So, you know, there's very, very transformative times right now, and a lot of it is being spurned on by mobile technology. Yeah, Carlo, I mean, a quick question as to Italy. I'm not the expert on Italy, even though I'm going there on Monday, and I do like Italian food, but... Uh, What's happening in Italy? Are people actually switching the behavior of how they're shopping? Are they shopping with mobile devices? Are they comparing prices in the store? Uh, well, this, this is a very interesting trend. In fact, uh, uh, Italy is not being uh, uh, really avant-garde in terms of market for, uh, for e-commerce. But for instance, mobile commerce is picking up very quickly. And uh, there are very, very interesting uh, increases uh, year over year. And uh, so this is a, an interesting trend. But apart from this, there, there is something that I wanted uh, to, to add. And I, I think it's quite uh, uh, common to uh, many people. So this idea uh, of uh, the fact that you can be delivered and have everything at home, and this is um, by definition better than uh, having to go to pick it up. Uh, I mean, it's not always true. Not for, for Italians. Instance, 
not always, not for all audience, for instance, for people constantly on the move, like me, it's a pain, honestly, it's a pain to have something delivered at home. I much prefer to go in a very convenient place and pick it up. Yeah, because but, I, do, but I never I, know where I am, and I have almost uh, spread over at least three places. Yeah, I mean, this clearly. Is one very trivial point. This is a cultural question, I, Carlo. Right? It's a cultural yeah. question. Let's go back to Doug here for a second, because I think the big point is yeah, the stuff you're talking about, are you talking about on a global scale? Are you talking about North Americans? or uh, Because clearly, you know, in, in, uh, in Korea, the Tesco people. At Tesco stores, they take a shot in the subway and then they have it sent at home, which is completely robotic, so to speak, uh, in terms of the... Uh, we wouldn't do that here in Switzerland. Uh, mm -hmm. But we do order stuff and have it delivered, uh, and, and there's more and more e-commerce. So is this a global thing, or is it really cultural? I, I, think, it's, I think it's both. And, and I'm not just saying that because it's the, the easy answer, but I really do believe that it's both. I think that <clears throat> globally, I think certainly everybody is being touched in some way by mobile uh, at a consumer level now, and, and and but that does change by country. So you'll find in Africa, for example, banking on your mobile devices is absolutely commonplace. Yeah. Whereas in North America, we're very reticent to do that. Uh, you know, price checking is is really the predominant usage right now at retail by consumers of their mobile devices. They're price checking, they're quality checking, they're looking for social proof before they make a purchase. It's very, very nascent. These are very, very early times. I would say, you know, if this was a, a baseball game, uh, we are in the first half of the first inning. Yeah, as it it's funny. To the, mobile. The, the thing is, you know, uh, what, about 15 years ago, I predicted in the music business that, that half of all the revenues were going to be mobile and digital, and everybody had a huge laugh. And it, this is basically what's happening now. But it's not too hard to predict that maybe half of the retail revenues will be in some way related to some interaction on the digital device, you know, in five years in most countries, somewhat related to, for example, coupons and location and all this stuff. Uh, this is uh, my view. This is, you know, it's not a bad thing for the record labels to go through this transformation to become more ubiquitous if they actually have value. And it turns out they didn't. <laughs> no, just kidding. In most cases. But, you know, if the retailers can add more value, then they'll be fine. But they, they, you know, this whole debate about being replaced by technology or so, in my view, is not really real. It's more like yeah. you have to, you get replaced by those that use the technology, right? Rather than technology yes. itself. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and I think the key thing that you hit there is that you need to find the new value that you as a retailer add to the equation. Because, of course, for centuries, the, the value you were adding was really two things access to the product and a little bit of product knowledge to put behind it. You know, so you would, you would add a little service element, give the consumer knowledge that they didn't have access to otherwise because of course we all lived in, you know, in a black box with no information. But now the consumer has probably more information at their fingertips than most of the people working in the store have. So the retailer needs to find new value to add and I think it's in the value is in the production that they put around the context there. Yeah. yeah, it's, 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 the, it's you know, the environmental it's, production. It's, right. it's strikingly similar to what's happening with the publishers and the uh, and the magazines. You know, the, it's, it's the context of how you read it. For example, I am a subscriber to The Economist only because they allow me to read it while I'm driving because it's reading to me in MP3. Uh, and, and this is the value of The Economist for you. Let's go back to Carlo for a question about Italy. Uh, you know, Italy, yeah. Italy has a lot of... Uh, large, uh, I wouldn't say monopolies, but media set, for example, is, is very prominent in the media landscape and television and so on. What about retailing? Are there big retailers who are worried about this? Are they doing anything about it? Well, I think that at the moment they are considering uh, this, uh, but I think that they are maybe more concerned about uh, uh, certain trends, which I uh, I know they are very strong in Italy, and I do not know how relevant they are outside Italy. Uh, for instance, I don't know if you have ever uh, heard of this terminology. In Italy, it's called chilometro zero, or chilometri zero, zero kilometer. Okay. So it is a sort of movement normally related with, uh, say, uh, good food and good health and good environmentalists uh, that... Uh, gives a premium to uh, all kinds of, uh, for instance, restaurants and also 
uh, small retailers selling local products. So there is a premium to this. Right. So clearly, this is something which is exactly uh, at the opposite of this idea of uh, products which are totally anonymous and can travel everywhere. And what is important is simply that you can find it uh, at home at the, the uh, lowest price. But of course, so you know, this is thing something is which is very important the, the and uh, picking up. Uh, quickly and could they have an impact I believe also on the general idea of retail. But of course the digital trend is actually works very nicely with that because when you have local products then you can have a local network you know you have location aware uh, uh, things and people are willing to pay a bit more if they know that it benefits the, the community and so on. I, I don't see a difference there I think I, I think that this natural food movement for example is a perfect fit with the social network movement of how this what's called social commerce, you know, that, that you buy things because you care about the other people who make them. To me, it's a perfect fit. In fact, this is what mm -hmm. most of, you know, most of the success of Whole Foods in America, for example, is based on this kind of digital networking uh, and, of course, on, on, on the food itself, right? But, um, you know, there, there's one thing I want to ask, Doug, about uh, the, the role of data in retailing. You, you mentioned it once, your destination is you. Kind of thing, yes. you know. Yeah. We call this big data, or data as a new oil, or whatever you want to call it. You know. Mm -hmm. So, what is the role of, of of knowing exactly who these people are, or or what they are doing, and what they like? It's just such a fascinating. I mean, we we could have t dedicated a whole uh, hangout just to this topic, right? Yeah. The whole data, the whole data topic. But um, there, there right now, the big movement in retail is to now try to capture this data and and overlay it onto the retail experience so a lot of the great attributes of the internet and of, of e-commerce things like knowing who came to your site knowing how many times they came to your site length of stay unique visitors uh, what they purchased how they purchased it all of that all that information now is information that can actually be captured and overlaid onto the physical retail experience giving retailers now a completely new level of insight into the performance of their stores. So, you know, that's the one big frontier now for retailers is to try and understand the implications of big data, how to use it. It's going to be a very bumpy road. You know, there's yeah, going to be a lot of... You know, one of those things is that they don't really know what, what in the world they have there. It's like I work with telcos and they have lots of data on their customers, but they're really scared of using it and they never cared about it. So now they've got these terabytes of stuff on, on each person, but they don't know what permission they have and so on. And I think privacy is a big issue. But I agree with you. I think that once you can harvest that data and get permission from people to serve them better, like coupons, location aware things and location sensitive. You know, I downloaded this app yesterday from LinkedIn. I think it's called Beware or something, where you mm -hmm. can find people around you that are on LinkedIn, like in a conference and you can connect with them that you met before. These tools are going to be very powerful, like Carlo has already talked about with the future of city. The same thing, right, if they are location aware. There's a lot of juice in there, but there's also a lot of concerns about, you know, can people track my behavior and, and deduct, you know, if I'm pregnant or not from, you know, from my shopping behavior, you know. Right. Those, th yeah. those things will be very strange, right? I mean, what's your take yes. on this? It, they will be, and, and I think the natural tendency on the part of most marketers is to regard these new tools as just a craftier way of achieving the same old goal yeah. of interrupting people. You know, I think that's the natural uh, reflex reaction that most marketers have to this. They figure, oh, this is just a better uh, a, a better interruption tool. Yeah. Um, and and the, of course, the enlightened marketer will will look at it the way you've just described and say, look, if if we can truly promise a consumer a better experience and a more customized, personalized experience as a result of them sharing this data with us willingly, then we're into a mutual exchange of value. And that's really the key thing. And my guess is that very few retailers will actually uh, be that enlightened to take that approach, but some are already doing so. Carlo, a question about Italy again. I mean, Italians are crazy about telefoninis, about their, their mobile phones. Most of them have two. You have to mute your button, do the mute button. Uh, so the question I have is like, are Italians going to take to this kind of uh, sensitive location or where shopping, like using smartphones to broadcast where they are, culturally speaking, uh, are they going to do this? Are they, are they going to be as crazy as, uh, say, uh, people in Korea or in Japan or even in America who are very quickly switching to this location or where way of moving around? 
Well, it's, it's, it's really difficult to predict. Uh, the Italians are mostly unpredictable. That's the point. Uh, so <laughs> That's the, the thing about them. <laughs> cer certainly, certainly um, um, I think that now it's, uh, a, uh, it's still the country with the highest density of uh, mobile numbers compared to population. But in terms of smartphone, penetration is not number one in the world, but close to. Uh -huh. And uh, what is really important is that uh, uh, it is the, the ratio. So it is the preferred uh, way of accessing internet to, mo uh, to the, the largest part of population. So there are many, many people who never access internet uh, through a desktop or a laptop, but uh, they do it systematically with the smartphone. Uh -huh. And uh, concerning privacy, I think here again, uh, you know, uh, for this kind of, uh, of uh, aspects, I think that rather than considering it purely from the point of view of uh, the principle of privacy, most of the people would uh, balance it. What I can get if I can relinquish some privacy. Okay. So it's a balance between... Uh, say, the perks and the advantages, okay, the commercial let me, let me advantages jump in I can get versus, to, versus the privacy. Let me, let me jump in. Let's go back to Ducky for a second. You know, I sometimes call this the Faustian bargain, you know, after yeah. the story of Faust, you know, making a deal with the devil. So when you are broadcasting your data and you're opting into the shopping networks and you're using all these apps to compare stuff and you get greeted by some robot when you get to the store who sends you a message for a coupon. Are you making a Faustian deal or why not just pay more and, ha and live in peace? I mean, uh, wh which way is it going to go in the future? My belief is that right now we're, we're in a very chaotic stage. You know, we are, as consumers, if you just look at any of us, if you take me, for example, uh, I give, if you look at me on LinkedIn, you're going to think I'm one kind of consumer. If you look at me on Facebook, you'll think I'm a completely different consumer. You might not even be able to tell it's the same person, you know. And the same would apply, you know, on Google Plus or, or eBay or wherever because I go to those places for different things. So I have these disparate profiles that are spread around the Internet. I'm not even aware half the time of what information I, I am sharing with retailers. Yeah. Um, so I think there's this tremendous sense of insecurity right now on the part of consumers that, they feel that all these different parties may be infiltrating their privacy and their security, and they're not really sure what it's adding up to in terms of value, to Carlos' point. So I think that where we're, where we're going is I think that there's ultimately going to be a market, a significant market, for what I call a meta service. Yeah. So if somebody that comes along and says, look, we will become the center of your consumer universe, we will guard your data, we will allow you to curate, what you do and do not share, like and you can do that bank. from one cent. Right. Pardon me. Like a data bank. E exactly, a data bank, and 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 also, um, uh, you know, a service that brings you things that you're interested in, as a, and filters out the, the the stuff you're not interested in. And I think personally, I think we can already see places, you know, businesses like Facebook and Google and, and others are already moving in that direction to try to become that center of our consumer universe. Yeah, makes but I think there's a yeah. market for it. I, I think that, uh, you know, this is one thing I'm trying to get across to uh, my, my customers all the time, is that the future is not about building better mousetraps. You know, this is a constant obsession with this, because, you know, you, you sort of think that when you build a better mousetrap, then you can make more money and you're going to be in the same position as before so that people cannot live without you, right? But by building a mousetrap, you become dispensable because people don't like mousetraps. And this is, a, right. this is a big obsession. You know, when you become, uh, when you're not indispensable, then eventually you become dispensable. And this is what happened to Tower Records, you know, for example. And this is what happens to other retailers. And this is what happens to bookstores if they don't figure out a way to become indispensable, which admittedly is difficult. You know, I, I don't know what your advice would be about bookstores, but uh, so I, I think this is definitely something that uh, we should refer on a little bit more. Let's uh, let's talk about your book for a second because I don't I want people to look at your book and it's over there. So uh, tell us about the book briefly. Um, yeah, the the book is called the Retail Revival: uh, Reimagining Business for the New Age of Consumerism. And and I guess the key the key for me is that notion of reimagining. I think we're we're in a period of time now where 
we are experiencing exponential change and com some companies are still making the mistake of responding with incremental improvement yeah. uh, and, and it, it becomes a, a, a failing proposition. So I really believe that we're at a time where retail businesses in particular need to reimagine what they do and they need to do it before some 22-year-old kid from California invents an app that does it for Beijing. them. You know? It's going to be Beijing, so, not California, Beijing. <laughs> exactly, yeah, that's right. Or Morocco, yeah. Or Sicily, um, maybe, I don't know. Sicily, Rome, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so, so it really sort of approaches this from a historic perspective and looks at where we've come from uh, in terms of consumerism and retailing and, and consumer behavior, and then where, of course, we're, we're headed and, okay. and the big change is on the horizon. Okay, this is available on Amazon in the usual formats, right? Okay. It is, yeah, uh, uh, available uh, on Kindle uh, or in hardcover. Okay, great. And uh, we're going to do some more work together in the future on the future of retailing. Uh, we're working you on some, some interesting projects, and hopefully you get to see more on this channel. Uh, uh, so let's uh, go to Carla for a second to just let us know, Carly, where can people find out more about your work and in general about the uh, Smart Cities thing that you're working on? Is there any website you can point us to or, or maybe just use your Twitter account? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you can uh, follow me on, on Twitter. I'm quite uh, active on it. Uh, I, my nickname is uh, uh, Nerissimo, N-E-R-I-S-S-I-M-O. That means deep black in Italian. <laughs> and uh, also there is a, an interesting site where you can see some uh, of the application, digital application that... Uh, I'm uh, following here in Rome. Uh, there is this uh, portal that's called uh, Futuring, um, and uh, that's Futuring.it, and uh, you, it's it's a portal for digital application for cultural heritage, and uh, it's quite rich, and uh, you can see many uh, applications uh, already fully working here, and also some ideas of the evolution. Very good, and, well, and uh, Doug, tell us about your Twitter handle and your website. Yeah, the Twitter handle is uh, at Retail Profit, and uh, it's Profit, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, okay. uh, as Garrett pointed out at the beginning. And uh, the website is RetailProfit.com, so you can go there to get any information you like about me. And we also have got a Facebook page. Uh, you can just search Retail Profit on Facebook if you're interested in seeing things about the, the future of retail. <laughs> Great. So you can find out more about me at futurewithgerd.com. That's G E R D like the gastrointestinal reflux disease, but better. Uh, and I'm, I'm G. Leonhard, G-L-E-O-N-H-R-D on Twitter. And uh, we're all together, team members in the Futures Agency and working worldwide together whenever we can. And the futuresagency.com has our blog posts and all that stuff. And we also have a really great new site called Future Feed, which is a Twitter feed. And if you just go to at Future Feed, F-E-E-D, you see all our combined tweets that we're we're putting out every every day a couple of them, quite a bit on the future of commerce and retail and stuff. So I think this is a hot topic. This won't be the last time that we're talking. Um, I think this retail and you know, what I call the future of buying, uh, the future of shopping, and which basically is the future of, of commerce, uh, mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a huge topic in the future. So I look forward to talking to all of you again.